Well, hello, congregation, family and friends and Bereans. I pray that all was well with you. Thank you for joining me today for the broadcast. As always, I give you a moment to get your Bibles ready or whatever you're going to be taking your notes with. And I am going to give you a heads up now. We're going to start looking at a particular passage in John chapter 3, but I have quite a few other scriptures here that I've listed that I'm going to give you. So if you are someone who takes notes, get ready to take some notes, okay? Um uh, Today's message has been heavy on my heart, um, and it's not an unfamiliar message. I've certainly covered this topic before, but it's really weighing on me today. And oh, the Holy Spirit a little while ago said, get on the air and just share this message for those who need to hear it today. So today I'm bringing you one of those good old-fashioned come-to-Jesus messages. You know, time is short, okay? And we don't have time to play around. Because Jesus could be back at any time, or any one of us are all one breath away from eternity. And we need to get serious. And when we lose someone, the death of something, a pet, or a family member, or we hear of a co-worker, uh, every day in the news, I, I, we're seeing people who are being killed in various ways, or dying of natural causes, or whatever. It should bring to mind that all of us at one time are going to pass. And none of us, do we know how long we have in this world? We do not. All of us are one breath away from going into eternity. There's only two people really in the history of the world that have never experienced physical death. And both of those, you know, of course, are listed in the Bible. And But in case you didn't know, the first one, his name was Enoch. And you can read about him in Genesis chapter 5. The Bible simply says that he was walking with God and he, then he was not because God took him. The other person we read about is Elijah. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, if you haven't read that story lately, he's taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. So neither one of those men actually experienced physical death. But for the rest of us, we are going to experience physical death unless we are here when Jesus returns. But that's another matter for another message, for another video. But the rest of us, if, we're, if, if Jesus does not return, we are going to experience physical death. And so there's a couple of things in, related to that that we need to make sure that we know beyond a doubt. Number one, death is 100%. All of us are going to be experiencing that. That's one thing we do know. Another thing that we know is that all of us are going to be spending eternity, that is forever, in one of only two places. And so the question I have for you today is, are you absolutely sure? Are you certain of where you're going? If this is the last video you ever see, if today is your last day here on earth, are you absolutely sure of the location that you're going to be going? Where are you going to be spending eternity? It is a deadly serious question because the answer to that question will determine where you're going to spend eternity. And I know this is a heavy topic. And so let me just lighten it up a little bit if I can. All right. I heard I heard a rather humorous story a while back that I wanted to share with you. Okay. And I just made a couple of notes on it here. But I wanted you to hear this because this message is indeed so, it's just, it's weighing on my heart, friends. I mean, when we lose loved ones, how often do they say, oh, he's in a better place. Oh, she's in a better place. But unless they profess Christ, they're not in a better place. Can we see the urgency here? Can we see the importance of this? And so we're talking about location. So let me just share this with you. This may bring uh, a smile on your face. Uh, and before we get back into the seriousness of this message, there was a teenager who got his very first job and his job was delivering flowers for a florist. Well, he was really eager on his first day on the job. He reports on time. He goes into the shop and it turns out that there's two arrangements there waiting for him to deliver. One of them is going to a church because they're dedicating their new sanctuary, their new building. The other one is going directly to a funeral home. Well, this young man in his eagerness got absolutely confused and he took each arrangement to the wrong location. 
Oh, well, a little later in the day, the florist manager gets a call from a rather upset minister. And the minister said, hey, we've got a basket of flowers sitting outside of our new sanctuary here. And the banner on it says, rest in peace. And the manager says, well, you think you got problems. He said, somewhere in this city, there is a casket that's riding around in a hearse and there's flowers on top of it with the banner that says, good luck in your new location. Now, I say that because it, it, that is humorous. However, this is deadly serious business. We know, don't we? There's only two locations that all of us are going to wind up in. It's either heaven or it's hell. There are some people don't like to preach about hell. There are some people don't like to talk about hell or think about hell. I am not one of those preachers. It is a fact that Jesus talked more in the Gospels about hell than heaven. Why? One reason. He doesn't want people to go there. He doesn't want people to wind up there. Hell was never created for mankind. Hell was created for the devil and his angels and all of those that rebelled against God. But if you reject Jesus and he's not your Lord and Savior, that is going to be your eternal location. Now, I know there are people, there are ministries out there even today that are preaching and teaching that hell is not literal, that it is not real, that hell is grave. And when if you die as an unbeliever, you cease to be. I do not believe that. I do not believe the Bible teaches that. And of course, I always encourage you to be a Berean at 1711 and search the scriptures for yourself to make sure if these things are so. Hell is real, but hell is also avoidable. You don't have to go there. You don't have to go there. God has provided a way out in his mercy, in his grace, in his compassion. He offers us a choice of where we are going to go. He doesn't have to do it, but I said there's going to be many scriptures here, so let me just give you this one. Here's Romans 5, verse 8. This is what God did for us. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his own love towards us while we were yet sinners. While you're sinning and I'm sinning, Christ died for us. He died for us long before you and I were ever conceived. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he wants to spend eternity with us. I titled this message, Location, Location, Location. It's a catchphrase, right? It's used in advertising. But you think about it, it's really critical. If you were going to open up a business, wouldn't you scout out the location first? Wouldn't you look at the demographics of the people to see if you would have enough of a customer base to open your business? You wouldn't just blindly go into any particular town or an area or a shopping mall, rent a building, put up a sign and hope people are going to show up. You're going to do your research. You're going to find the right location for your product or service. If you're a family and you have children in school and you're making a move from one area to another, are you just going to move into any old area? Or are you going to check the school system first to make sure that the schools are up to the quality that you're seeking, that they're teaching the curriculum that you want your children to learn? Wouldn't you look at that? Of course. We make those decisions here on earth all the time. We do location scouting. We make sure if we're moving to a place, it's a neighborhood or an area that we want to be in, that our kids are in the right school, that our businesses are opening in the right community that will support it. It's just locations. But how often do we think about where our eternal location is going to be? Well, it all starts with the necessity of being born again. So if you're with me in John 3, we're not going to go over this whole passage, but you know this is the encounter between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. And so as we look at John 3, we see a man here who should have known better, a smart man. He is a Pharisee. He is well studied. He knows the scriptures, but he's confused. He's not sure of things. He's uncertain of the way to get to the right location. And so let's skip over verses 1 and 2. I expect you to read all the passage. But Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he has this question. How? And Jesus answers him in verse 3 of John 3. He said, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again is absolutely, it's critical, it's crucial to being a true believer. You cannot be a true believer if you are not born again. You can't do it. And Jesus is saying here, unless you are born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Now let's clarify something. The kingdom of God is not physical. The kingdom of God is spiritual. It is eternal. It is made up and comprised of all of those true believers down through history. Well, Nicodemus doesn't quite understand that doesn't get it. And we can tell that because the very next verse, he asked two questions here. Listen, here's question one. How can a man be born when he is old? Question one. Question two. He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? You see, Nicodemus is confused because he's only understanding this on a physical or earthly level. He cannot see the spirituality of it. Jesus is talking about unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Immediately in Nicodemus's mind is, oh, I need to go back into my mother's womb and be born again. I got to go in there back when I'm old. So he's confused. He doesn't get it. He's lost. He's as lost as that delivery boy was delivering to the wrong locations. He doesn't, he's not getting it. Well, Jesus comes back at him here in verse five. It says, Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. First, he said you can't see it, and now he's saying you can't enter into it. Well, what is Jesus talking about here? He's saying unless one is born of water, and that would be natural birth, all of us, and when we were in our mother's birth canal, we are all encapsulated in water, are we not? So he's talking about the natural birth, unless we are born of water and the spirit. You'll notice the word spirit here is capitalized because it's the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about something external, something uh, inward, I should say, the Holy Spirit. So externally, we are born, we are physically born, and then internally through the Holy Spirit, we are born. And unless those two things happen, we are physically born and then we are spiritually born. He says we cannot even enter the kingdom of God. In other words, no admittance. You get to those pearly gates, you're not getting in. You have to be born again. Jesus goes on to say in verse six, he said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's our natural birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that is our spiritual birth or being born again. That's a, the clearest way to describe this. We are born physically and then we are born again spiritually. Okay. And then Jesus goes on in verse seven. He says, do not be amazed. Don't marvel at this. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Please notice the word must. He didn't say it's an option, did he? He didn't say you, you might have to be born again. He said you must be. That makes it no option. And that means it's, it's a necessity. If we desire to be in heaven, if we desire to become saved, Jesus himself, who paid for our sins, Jesus himself said you must be born again. Must. Do you see the urgency? Do you see why this is so important? Do you see why this is such a burden on my heart? This, this, almost every day I'm burdened with this, that people must be born again, because none of us know when we're heading off into eternity. Well, let's go down a little further. And again, I encourage you to read all of John 3 to get the full dialogue. But you know this verse, right? John 3, 16. We can quote it. I'm sure you can quote it. We know it. This is the entire gospel in one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. The most, I don't like using the word popular, the, the most well-known verse in all of scripture, right? John 3, 16. Well, what's he talking about? God so loved the world. Here's what I want you to do. Take out the word world and put your name in it. For God so loved Thomas that he gave his only begotten son, that would be Jesus Christ, 
that whosoever believes on him, that's either you, that's me, it's both of us, it's all of us, it's any of us, that whosoever believes on him will not perish. And that means in hell forevermore, not annihilation. Hell forevermore shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the result of being born again. When you have eternal life. If you're not sure of your salvation, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 that today is still the day of salvation here. And I'm going to start giving you some verses um, because I don't want you, I don't want you to be lost eternally. I, I need to tell you what the truth is and what God says. And so I want to share with you just a series of verses. But let me go back to 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. The Bible says this, it says, behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today, don't wait. You don't wait till tomorrow, next week, when you get older, when you're laying on your deathbed. You don't wait because none of us are guaranteed that we're going to be here again. Listen, here's a quote for you. Hell is not going to be full of people who Jesus rejected. Okay, listen to me carefully. Hell will not be full of people whom Jesus rejected. Hell is going to be full with people who rejected Jesus. Completely different matter. It's not Jesus that's rejecting people. I'll save you. I'm not going to save you. I'll save her. I'm not going to save him. That is not the God of the Bible. I used to believe that many years ago. I do not anymore. That is not the God of the Bible. God says, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and you will find rest for your souls. That's the God that we serve. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is telling us there it's exclusive. It comes through him. Salvation, being born again, is through him. And the only way that we have access to the Father, i.e. access back into heaven and a reconciliation with God, is through Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 tells us this, there is salvation in no one else, none, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's salvation in no one else. You can't go and get saved and be born again through some kind of other deity or some other way. There are not multiple ways to heaven. There are not many ways into back to God. There is one way. His name is Jesus Christ. It says there's no other name, Acts 4.12 tells us. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. It's Jesus and you get in or it's not Jesus and you don't get in. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, is actually simple to understand. Nicodemus wasn't understanding it. And we have no record that I am aware of in the Bible. We, we see a little bit later in the gospel of John where it looks like maybe Nicodemus came to truth. So I, I encourage you to read that. As a matter of fact, I did a video not long ago on who Nicodemus was. It's on my YouTube channel. And I do go into more detail as to more of Nicodemus' story. So I encourage you to go and look at that also. Remember the story of the Philippian jailer. It's in Acts chapter 16. Remember Paul and Silas, they were beaten and they were in, in, they were in stocks. And at midnight, they were singing hymns to God. And the jailer, you know, I'll let you read the whole story and tell you what happened there as you read that but the jailer suddenly says to them in verse 30 he says sirs what must i do to be saved and they say this believe in the lord jesus and you will be saved and your household i encourage you to read that portion of scripture in acts chapter 16 to find out what happened he's asking a question what must i do to be saved believe in the lord jesus christ Romans 10, verse 9, here's another one for you, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Are you starting to see a common pattern here? The word is believe. You have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You have to believe that he did 
what he did for you and me, that he paid for our sins, that he made that connection between a righteous God and sinful man. And he's that bridge. He made that connection back again so that when your time is up on earth and my time is up on earth, if we indeed are born again, we go straight into the presence of heaven. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 1 John 5, 12. It, can it get any clearer than this? He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I mean, again, it's very simple. It's a choice. He who has the Son, Jesus Christ, you have life. You have eternal life, just like John 3.16 promises. He who does not have the Son does not have life everlasting punishment, everlasting damnation. I know it's it's ugly. It's, it's hard to think about. It's like, how could God do that to us? Here's the question. God doesn't do it to us. We do it to ourselves. If you've ever had the question, or maybe you're even, as I'm broadcasting this, you're thinking, wait a minute, how could God ever send anyone to hell? God is not sending you to hell, and he's not sending me to hell. We make the choice to go there. And we make the choice by just rejecting Jesus. Listen, here's the last verse I think I'll give you. John 3, 36. Again, go back to John. Read all of John chapter 3. Here's what it says in John 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. That's being born again. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's eternity in hell. The wrath of God abides on him. Friends, I can't make it any clearer than that. Jesus said, you must be born again. It's a necessity. It's that step that we must take to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Where Nicodemus was a little confused in this particular passage, Jesus makes it very clear, and here and other passages, that he is the way and the truth and the life to eternal life. So, what location are you heading for? Where are you going to be spending eternity? I know where I am, and I don't say it out of arrogance. I don't say it because I'm better than you, because I'm not. I am a sinner saved by grace. That's it. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Read it. I'm not going to turn there now. We are sinners saved by grace. And I say this to you because I know because I am born again, and because Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that if I were to pass today or tonight, I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I pray that I see all of you there. I pray that this has helped you. Uh, again, this was kind of impromptu. I wasn't planning to bring this message this morning, but God said, do it. So here I am just trying to be obedience. Remember Isaiah 55, 11, God says in his word that it doesn't return void. He sends it out and it accomplishes the purpose to which he sent it. So that means if it was meant for you today, you heard it today and your eyes and ears were open to the truth of the word. I also encourage you always to be a Berean. Acts 17, 11 tells us the Bereans were more open-minded. They listened to the apostle Paul preach to them there in their synagogue. And then they went and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so daily. That's what you should be doing. That's what I do. Don't trust me. Don't trust your favorite pastor, preacher, your favorite podcast. If you go to a church, you're reading Christian books, wherever you are hearing the word of God preached or taught, you owe it to yourself. Just like I gave you a handful of scriptures, go back and study all those scriptures. Go back and look at all those main points that I made in this broadcast or anything that I do, or any of, any of us do, and make sure that what you are hearing is the truth. Because there is a lot of things out there that are being taught and preached that are just not true. You can't prove them biblically. And we need to be good, discerning, diligent Bereans. Please do that. Please do that. Feel free to share this video or anything that I post. This is for God's glory. The edification of the saints. Proverbs 27 tells us that iron sharpens iron. We are supposed to sharpen one another, help one another on this walk that we call Christianity. It is not an easy walk sometimes. It is challenging, isn't it? 
it is challenging, and especially in this modern world, it's tough. So we're supposed to lift one another up and sharpen one another. Let's do that. And if this video or anything that I post can help someone, please feel free to share it. Lastly, make sure that you reach out to me on any of my social media platforms if I can help you. Uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I have a Spotify podcast called Living in Harmony Christian Ministries. There's over 200 episodes over there on the podcast if you want to listen. And you can watch some of them, too. And, of course, I have a YouTube channel. Please make sure you subscribe to it. Make sure your notifications are on. I am working on the channel every day. Something new just went up this morning, an older broadcast that I revived and edited. Uh, I posted something. There's a little uh, blog over there that I've started working on. So lots of exciting things going on on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss any of it, okay? Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for spending some time with me. For some of you, this may have been just a rehash. For some of you, you may know this all already, but there just might be a person who's watching this, who now understands the necessity of being born again and the surety that we can spend eternity with Jesus simply by being born again and believing in him. I hope that's you, and I hope to see you soon, and until then, God bless you.